Every day, federal scientists are looking for new ways to kill bugs. Your basic arachnid warrior isn't too smart, but you can blow off a limb. And it's still 86% combat effective. Here's a tip. Aim for the nerve stem and put it down for good. Would you like to know more? Hello there. In this video I'm going to be discussing some very detailed tactics for dealing with each demon type in Doom Eternal. And taking into account not just the demons themselves, but also the context in which they appear, like the weapons that you have, other demons that appear with them, and so on and so forth. Going as far as, in some cases, discussing uh, individual instances of demons that are particularly tricky or that have particularly good ways of dealing with them. Uh, to explain that, I should say that I am an Ultra Nightmare 100% speedrunner, um, so definitely a lot of the things that I will be saying are affected by that, and they will be from a speedrunning kind of perspective. However, I am very certain that uh, a lot of the things that I will say will be useful for other people who play the game more casually, um, especially in Ultra Nightmare, but even if it is not an Ultra Nightmare. Uh, although I will be using all the weapons, so uh, for some of the demons in late game, if you are playing the game without getting all the weapons or without getting all the upgrades, then uh, you might have to change some things, but I think it will, should still be uh, fairly useful. So where to start? Well, obviously in the beginning, and that means zombies. You'll surely say, well, zombies are so easy, it's not even worth talking about them. Mm, I disagree, especially in a speedrunning context, but not just in a speedrunning context. Zombies become irrelevant later on, but they can be dangerous in the beginning and it's definitely worth thinking about them a bit. So let's talk about the first room. What you're seeing is the ideal way to deal with it, one shot for each zombie. However, even speedrunners sometimes have to reset in this room because they don't kill a zombie after one shot. Um, the way to kill a zombie in one shot with a shotgun is to aim for the shoulders, so slightly under the neck and really close up. Um, however, this can be dangerous because they can hit you before you get close, or you can miss the shot and not kill them in one shot, and that's annoying for speed running specifically, but also annoying in a casual playthrough. Now, if any of you have played Doom 2016, you know that in that game, a really good way to deal with zombies was to punch them once to uh, stagger them and then glory kill them. And a lot of us tried to do that in Doom Eternal, and it didn't work. Regular punches in Doom Eternal deal no damage, or do they? It turns out that regular punches actually do exactly one damage in Doom Eternal. So you can kill zombies and any demon for that matter with punches, you just need to hit them 200 times with them. Here's a challenge for anyone who has the patience for it, finish Doom Eternal only with punches. You can actually do that because there's some bosses that cannot be hit by punches, but other than that you should be pretty able to do it. Going back to actually useful ways to kill the zombies, sticky bombs are for sure one of the best ways to deal with zombies, even in groups. The area of effect damage kills them almost every time, it requires little aiming and it allows you killing them in groups, so it's a really good option. As you probably know, blood punch recharges by glory killing demons. Zombies are a great source for this, you need two demons to charge one charge of blood punch. In order to glory kill zombies, the easiest way is to hit them with a heavy cannon twice on the chest. It works every time. Another great way to finish zombies with a heavy cannon is precision bolt. One shot on any place of the body will kill them instantly. Often we need to kill a group of zombies as quickly as possible. For that, hit plus is ideal. One charge will uh, instantly kill zombies in its AoE. Moreover, if you want to master Heat Blast, finding groups of zombies to kill with it is a great way to, to get the mastery challenge. Although it's a bit more of a scarce resource, a frag grenade will also do the job. Finally, when you don't have time for bullshit and just want to guarantee the kill, the super shotgun is your friend. Now that was quite a bit. Fortunately, a lot of what I said about zombies, in one way or another, also applies to some of the other types of fodder. So what I'll do is 
talk about them and talk about how they are different and what other ways we may have to for the other fodder that are not exactly the same as zombies. Imps are actually very similar to zombies, they have the same amount of health and the same resistances and weaknesses to weapons. They just move a lot faster and are a bit more aggressive, which makes the preferred tactics to deal with them slightly different. Just like with zombies, a shotgun to the chest, a sticky bomb to the face or to the body, or a precision bolt at any point of the body are ideal ways to deal with imps. Heat Blast will also of course instantly kill imps, and the Super Shotgun is probably a much preferred option for imps since they're always moving and hitting them with the Combat Shotgun is a lot harder. Just like zombies, two heavy cannon shots to the chest is an ideal way to stagger them. And generally speaking, you're gonna be using Stickies, Precision Bolt and the Super Shotgun to deal with them as quickly as possible. Possessed soldiers have more hit points, and therefore a single shotgun shot will never kill them, no matter the distance or the place of the body. This also means that stickies need to hit them strictly in the body to kill them, as the AOE itself will not. Similarly, a single charge of hit blast will not kill possessed soldiers, instead need two of them to guarantee the kill. Finally, you need 4 heavy cannon shots to stagger them instead of 2. Following the order in which enemies are presented in the game, let's talk about the first heavy type enemy, Arachnotrons. You'll learn to hate these things if you don't already. Arachnotrons are introduced very early and are actually one of the toughest heavies there are. Because Arachnotrons are presented very early in the game, the preferred way to deal with them changes as you get more weapons. So let's focus first on the Arachnotrons on the first level, Hell on Earth. Here is my favorite way to deal with the first Arachnid turn in the game. It may sound like a joke, but reserving fuel to deal with particularly problematic demons in particular fights in the game is a very used strategy in, the, in Doom Eternal, and Arachnid turns are high priority for this tactic. In principle, on Hell on Earth you can kill up to 3 Arachnid turns with Chainsaw. However, doing that would require collecting every single fuel pickup in the level and also waiting around for a bit to re for your fuel to naturally regenerate in a few cases. So normally most people kill one or two Arachnotrons with potential in the first level. But there are at least five Arachnotrons that you must kill on Hell on Earth. So how to deal with the others? Well, here's my least favorite enemy in the entire game. The second Arachnotron. This guy alone is probably responsible for more than double the number of Ultra Nightmare deaths for me than any other enemy in the game. The strategy is disable the turret and then deal as much damage as you can to it, which in my case means sticky bombs and then swap into the heavy cannon when those are full. Later on you will get precision bolt, the plasma rifle, the frag grenades and blood punch. Just throw everything at it. I should mention that a strategy used by many people is to switch the shotgun to the auto shotgun mod and deal with her anotrons that way. It's a very respectable strategy and it's really quick, but I really dislike it because it consumes so much shotgun ammo and it requires you swapping back and forth between the stickies and the auto shotgun. Let's talk for a second about the anotrons turret. The only way that you have to disable it at first is with the sticky bombs. But this becomes unreliable later on because it's hard to aim and even if you seem to hit it, sometimes it won't disable it. Of course, if you're going to manually master sticky bombs, you have no choice. Of course, my preferred way to disable Arachnotron turrets is precision bolt. It never, uh, I mean, almost never fails. Another viable way to disable the Arachnotron turret is Heat Blast. However, note that you will need not one, not two, but three charges of Heat Blast to disable a turret. Finally, another way to disable an Arachnotron turret is Ballista. However, by the time you get Ballista in the game, you don't really need to disable Arachnotron turret, but we'll talk about that in a bit. 
As I mentioned earlier, the preferred strategy to deal with the Atmotrons changes throughout the game as you get more weapons. The first big difference comes when you get the Super Shotgun. If you're watching this video, I expect that you've at least heard of the term Quickswap. For those of you who may not know, Quickswap is the technique that exploits the fact that weapon firing cooldowns get reset when you swap weapons to quickly switch between different weapons, shooting each of them once, dealing higher DPS than you would fire in any single weapon alone. You will be using many Quickswap rotations throughout the game, but the first big one is the Super Shotgun and Precision Bolt. You see, the Super Shotgun is the highest DPS weapon of the game when quick swapped, and Precision Vault is very flexible in its range, working both at very long ranges and short ranges, it consumes very little ammo and is very quick to shoot, which is useful, and it also deals a decent amount of damage, even if not as much as other weapons. Going back to our Arachnotrons, when you get the Super Shotgun and begin using this quick swap rotation, you can stop caring about the turret, you're gonna kill Arachnotrons quickly enough that it won't matter. Now it will never hurt to aim to the turret when you're using position both, but it's not really very relevant as they don't take extra damage when being hit in the turret. Another quick swap rotation used very often, and particularly on our Atmotrons, is the Super Shotgun and Ballista. While it's not technically the highest damage quick swap, it's the most reliable one from the high damage ones. Finally, we could not talk about our Atmotrons without talking about Lockdown Burst. This mod is so good. It is actually the highest DPS in the game other than super weapons, higher than any quick swap rotation you can think of. So when talking about our Atmotrons in particular, Lock and Burst, if the three rockets hit them, instantly stagger them and leave them very easily finishable by a simple precision bolt or an SSD shot in the face. Now you may see all this information and think, okay this is so many ways to kill Atmotrons but which one is the best? Well, the truth, and the reason why Doom Eternal is such a good game, is that the best depends on the context. More particularly, it depends a lot on what ammo you have available, how much space you have to fight the demon, and what other demons come with them. This changes how you want to tackle each demon drastically. Continuing with demons that appear on the first level, Hell on Earth, let's talk about Kako demons. The game itself tells you what's the best way to deal with Kako demons, at least in the beginning. Just love a sticky bomb in their mouth and they will instantly stagger so that you can glory kill them. This is actually the preferred tactic for dealing with Kako demons, at least for the first few levels, until you get the Super Shotgun. The Super Shotgun just changes everything in the game, but we'll talk about that later. Talking about the instant stagger mechanic, you can actually do it with frag grenades as well. However, frag grenades are generally more useful for fodder since they have more damage and AoE, and they're also harder to aim into the mouth of a Kako demon, so I just recommend you use stickies unless they're on cooldown. The main issue with the instant stagger mechanic of Kako Demons is that you need to glory kill them, and this can be, especially in a speedrunning context, particularly slow, even with the faster glory kill upgrade. So once you get the super shotgun, you can just kill them without glory killing them faster than you would with the instant stagger mechanic if you quick swap them. A particular version of quick swapping that some people call dry swapping consists in swapping between one weapon and the heavy cannon but not shooting the heavy cannon at all, just using the quick swap to reset the fire cooldown and it's still faster than waiting for the cooldown, particularly with the super shotgun and the ballista. Well, dry swapping the ballista to shoot a Kako demon twice is the fastest way to kill a Kako demon. Of course, if you want to be mastering the Arbalest mode of the Ballista, you want to be killing Kako Demons with it. Uh, this is actually pretty fast as well, almost as fast as the Quick Swap. It consumes less ammo, and sometimes if you pre-charge it, it's even faster, so it's a pretty good way to kill Kakos overall. The last useful way that I want to mention to kill Kako Demons is Lock and Burst. Lock and Burst is way more damage than the health that the Kako Demon has, and it's kind of a waste of ammo, but it can be quite good when you want a quick kill and you're far and don't have Ballista, so nothing else really works. That pretty much covers every demon on the first level, doesn't it? Not really, don't you think that I have forgotten about tentacles? 
As many people have noted, tentacles, especially on higher difficulties, can be one of the best ways to die in Doom Eternal. But they're quite easy to deal with if you're expecting them. Personally, my favorite way to deal with tentacles is to throw a sticky at their base right before they spawn. Many people prefer the alternative, which is a well-timed precision bolt just as they come out. Occasionally, a pre-charged hit blast can be a great way to deal with several tentacles at the same time. You can even change so tentacles, but I don't recommend it as they tend to be buggy and it's dangerous. With this, we can finally move on from Hell on Earth and onto the second level, Exultia. And the first new enemy introduced in Exultia are gargoyles. You see, in Doom 2016, in Ultra Nightmare, the most dangerous enemy by far were imps. They had huge damage, really good aim, and there were many of them. In Doom Eternal, they're not so powerful, they deal less damage and don't attack so often. But Hugo was having none of that, so he said, hey, we need a new enemy to replace imps, and that's where gargoyles stand. Now, they're not exactly the same as Doom 2016 imps, uh, but if you get close to them without killing them, they will turn you into threats really, really quickly. From a how-to-kill point of view, gargoyles stand somewhere in the middle between imps and possessed soldiers, having little more health than imps and little less health than possessed soldiers. This means that while they technically die in one shot of the shotgun to the chest, this is not a recommended strategy because they move so much, and by the time they are introduced you already have better tools to deal with them. However, stickies are still a great way to kill them, even in groups with the AoE, as is precision bolt and the super shotgun. The meat hook is particularly useful for gargoyles to make them stop moving around before you murder them. Speaking about killing gargoyles in groups, frag grenades will of course kill them pretty much every time, but the real tool to consider here is Hit Blast. Especially on Exultia's Slayer Gate, but also in many other places afterwards in the game, this mod just makes clearing fodder so much easier. Take it into account. Also, since gargoyles have an intermediate amount of hit points between imps and possessed soldiers, they actually take three heavy cannon shots to stagger. The next enemy type introduced in Exultia are Hell Knights, and just like Aragnotrons, the way that you deal with them changes quite a bit during the game. Early on, you want to use a similar strategy to Arachnotrons by using stickies, precision bolt, grenades, and blood punch as fast as you can to deal as much damage uh, to them as you can. Although Hell Knights are more of a kiting enemy than a full-on let's do damage to them, uh, enemy like Arachnotrons are. At this stage, it is worth keeping in mind that not only precision bolt headshots Hell Knights, but sticky bombs actually also do. So remember to aim for the head. Later on, while well, you can use different quick swapping techniques to deal with Hell Knights, there really is one major preferred technique to deal with them, and that is Lock and Burst. The reasons are many. First of all, one Lock and Burst kills a Hell Knight, that's important. Second of all, because of the nature of Hell Knights, you're usually gonna want to be far from them, so Lock and Burst is comfortable to fire from that direction. Third, they are fast moving, so Lock and Burst, because it locks on the target and it doesn't uh, require you actually aiming exactly on them, makes it a lot easier to hit them. And finally, they are kind of slim and hard to hit with uh, hit, hit scan and similar weapons, so Lock and Burst is much better to deal with them. Finally, I'd like to mention two niche ways of killing Hell Knights that are not really used very often but are worth knowing about. The first one is that a fully charged destroyer blade will instantly stagger a Hell Knight. The second one is that an arbalest in the head will also instantly stagger them, however this last one is cool at best and not really practical. Continuing with Exultia, the next enemy introduced are Revenants, and yet again the initial strategy is just throw everything at them. But here I want to take a moment to think about what this really means. And this will apply as well to Arachnotrons and Hell Knights, with which we already talked about. Um, when I'm talking about using stickies, precision bolt and plasma, there is actually some method to this madness. 
first of all you wanna unload all of your stickies because the cooldown of the sticky bombs refreshes quicklier if it's all three at a time than if you let it refresh one at a time. Then while the stickies are on the cooldown you wanna swap to precision bolt, shoot one precision bolt and then swap again to plasma and use plasma for as long as you need until the sticky bomb cooldown is back up and then use a uh, precision bolt in between the plasma and the sticky bombs because it's the highest dps and then go back to stickies and start again when you don't have plasma still in the beginning then you just do the same except you go straight from precision bolt back to sticky bombs and you're probably gonna have to wait a bit for the cooldown to refresh Going back to Revenants, however, once you get the Lock on Burst mod, that's gonna be mostly your main way to deal with Revenants. However, this isn't as prevalent as with Hell Knights, and there are many other valid ways to kill Revenants that are used throughout the game. A really cool one is to use a fully charged Destroyer Blade. Not only does this allow you to get multi kills, sometimes including multiple Revenants, but it is great on the Arc Complex level because there there is a challenge to destroy the rockets from the Revenants and for some reason when you kill a Revenant with the Destroyer Blade you always destroy both of its rockets before so it's a really easy and quick way to get the challenge. Something that happens with Revenants is that the amount of hit points that they have combined with the size of their model makes it so that a point blank super shotgun shot can in fact one shot stagger them though you need to be really close up and point into the center of mass for this to happen. Even when this doesn't stagger them though, it's still a lot of damage and you can easily finish it up with a precision bolt quick shot. So this is particularly useful when you know where the revenant is going to spawn and you can be ready beforehand. Finally, when you're far from the revenant and you either don't have rockets or there's an obstacle in the way that you're afraid might block the lock and burst, then you might use a ballista precision bolt swap to kill the revenant. Two ballista shots and one precision bolt should kill it, while two ballista shots dry swapped should stagger it. Another enemy introduced in Exultia are Lost Souls. Uh, these are fairly simple. The game tells you that you can freeze them, but that's kind of a waste of a freeze bomb and it's very rarely used. Instead, normally you just deal with them with the heavy cannon or the plasma, they have very few hit points. A good strategy as well is to pre-charge a hit blast uh, to kill a bunch of lost souls in one go. There is one last enemy type introduced in Exultia and that is Dread Knights. There are two Dread Knights in Exultia's Slayer Gate and let me just be clear about this right, right now, this is cruel for the Nightmare. Dread Knights become less of a problem later on when you get more tools, but in Exultia, where you don't even have fast dash or ice bomb, they're just sadistic. That's all there is to it. So once again, let's first talk about those two Dread Knights appearing in Exultia's Slayer Gate, and later on we'll talk about the rest of them, which do not appear back until Super Gardeners, which is much later in the game. The first Dread Knight that spawns in the Chulcha Slayer Gate, just chainsaw it. Just do this. Just get fuel, have it ready, be ready for it to spawn and chainsaw it. It will make your life 100% better. For the second one, you're gonna have to just deal with it the same way that you deal with heavies in Exultia. Just throw everything at it, precision bolt, frag grenade, uh, sticky bombs, heat blast, plasma, etc. For the rest of the game, Dread Knights have the same amount of hit points as Arachnotrons, but they behave a lot more like Hell Knights. So there's really one prime way to deal with it, which is to stagger them with Lock and Burst, and then finish them with a Precision Bolt, or Glory Kill them, or just drop a Frag Grenade at their feet. Quick swapping is a legitimate option with Dread Knights, but because of their relatively small size, how mobile they are, and especially how dangerous they are in close quarters, low converse just is a much better option.
it's time to move to the next level, Cultist Base. Of course, as we move onwards, we'll begin to have less new demons introduced on each level. The first demon type introduced in Cultist Base are Mecha Zombies. And it's very easy to dismiss Mecha Zombies as just a tougher version of Zombies. And it is in fact surprising how in a game so based around speed as Doom Eternal, a really slow enemy like Mecha Zombies can be one of the most dangerous ones if you aren't careful with them. Generally speaking, in higher difficulties you don't want to be seen near a Mecha Zombie unless you're killing it. The main issue with Mecha Zombies, especially early in the game, is that they are designed to be inconvenient. They're, they have the right amount of hit points so that a single precision bolt in the body or a single sticky bomb in the body will never kill them. Instead, need headshots to get kills. That is actually a great place to start. Mecha Zombies are really easy to stagger. A single sticky bomb to the body or a single precision bolt to the body will stagger them, but not kill them. Which brings us to the main way that you want to kill Mecha Zombies, a headshot with precision bolt. Fortunately, not much later than Mecha Zombies are introduced, you get the Super Shotgun, and that does kill them in one shot, so that's a great way to deal with them as well. And without going into too much more detail, Mecha Zombies are still fodder, so as you advance in the game, they do become less relevant, though still dangerous if you're not careful with them. I will mention one last thing though, which is that you can still kill Mecha Zombies with Hit Blast as long as you have at least two charges of it. But enough talking about Mecha Zombies, let's move to something bigger, Monkey Buy. As with most heavies up until this point, the main strategy against Monkey Buy in the beginning is just throw everything at them. Though it is worth mentioning that against Monkey Buy it is particularly interesting to disable their hand cannons, even later in the game. When I talk about Agnotrons, I mentioned how reserving fuel to kill them quickly in certain situations is a very used strategy. Well, this strategy is actually used even more for Monkey Buy. They're one of the main targets for Chainsaw. Going back to Cultist Base, you actually won't have to deal with Monkey Buy only with small weapons for long, because in Cultist Base you actually get two of the most important weapons in the game, Lock and Burst and the Super Shotgun, and you bet they are both relevant for Monkey Buy. Just count, how many enemies do I kill with Lock and Burst on this side? Focusing on Lock and Burst first, Monkey Buy have a little bit more health than Arachnotrons, which means that a single Lock and Burst will not stagger them. However, a Lock and Burst followed by a Precision Bolt will stagger them. Or even better, a Lock and Burst followed by another Rocket, or a Super Shotgun Shot, or a Ballista Shot will actually kill them. In fact, sometimes when you know there will be a Monkey Bus spawning in or at a specific spot, you can fire Rocket to that spot before it spawns, and then a Lock and Burst. When it comes to quick swapping, any of the reasonable rotations make sense for Monkey Buy. It just depends on your ammo availability and how close you are to them. Uh, but do remember that if you're using Precision Bolt, it will never hurt and it will actually be quite useful to aim for the cannons.
The next new enemy type introduced in Cultist Base are Shield Soldiers. The game tells you to use the plasma rifle to shoot at their shields so that it kills them through the shield and it explodes, dealing damage to other enemies. And this is actually not a bad idea. It's not the best way, but it's pretty good when you have especially groups of shield soldiers. It's also really good if you have heat blast, because heat blast itself will also penetrate the shield and kill them. And unlike regular possessed soldiers, you actually only need one charge of heat blast to do it. The main issue with Plasma, however, is that it takes a while to kill them, and this is not only an issue when speedrunning, it can also be an issue in a casual playthrough, because you kind of want to get rid of Shield Soldiers as soon as possible, since they do a lot of damage if they come up close. In that regard, and before I get to other methods of dealing with Shield Soldiers, I should say that chainsawing them is always a great option, they're the best type of fodder to chainsaw. Other than that, a pretty effective method is to hook them with a super shotgun and then shoot them. When you hook them, they automatically put the shield aside so you can actually shoot them with a super shotgun, it's pretty cool. The problem with that is that the hook has a cooldown, so when you have to kill several of them, you kind of have to idle around waiting for the cooldown. So finally, the last method that I'm going to mention is to shoot a rocket to their feet. This is just good and has no cooldown. Did I say the last method? I'm sorry, I lied. I have to mention Destroyer Blade. Like any other type of fodder, Destroyer Blade will instantly kill shield soldiers that it touches, no matter how much charge you use on Destroyer Blade. But the thing is, Destroyer Blade deserves a lot more talk, and we will do that in a while, so for now just keep in mind, Destroyer Blade instantly kills shield soldiers, even through the shield. The next enemy introduced in Cultist Base are Whiplashes, and before I tell you how to kill Whiplashes, I'm going to tell you how not to kill Whiplashes. Do not try to whip swap them from up close. Whiplashes are extremely dangerous up close and they're really thin, so quick swapping is actually a very bad method for dealing with them in general. Though there is some sort of exception to that that I'll mention in a second. Do you remember what I said about Hell Knights and why Lokon was the main way to deal with them? They are fast, thin, you want to be far from them, and they die from one Lokon. Well, all of that applies twice or three times for Whiplashes. So yeah, Lokon is the main method to deal with Whiplashes by far. If you are clever and you get Lokon Burst as soon as you can, there's only one fight in the entire game in which you have to deal with Whiplashes without having Lokon, the one you're seeing right now. For that one, I just recommend you learn it and find some way that works for you and don't overthink it. As a hint, I can say that Heat Blast is, can be pretty useful for this fight. But Whiplashes have the same amount of health as Revenants and the same resistances, so they actually die from one full destroyer blade the same way as Revenants do, and this is a great way to deal with them as well, especially if there's more than one Whiplash. It is also worth knowing that once you have the mastery, a two-thirds charge of destroyer blade will also stagger them. Finally, the two quick swap methods that I mentioned for Revenants, since they're long range because they're Ballista and Precision Bolt, can be effective for Whiplashes if the other options are just not working out. There is one last enemy that is introduced slightly early in the Cultist Base Slayer Gate, and that is Prowlers. Prowlers are actually surprisingly easy to deal with once you learn how to, and my favorite way to do this by far, and the one that I use almost on every Prowler in the game, is to hook them with a super shotgun so that they stop moving, and then shoot them with a the super shotgun once up close. It kills them in one shot if you, if you wait long enough. The hardest part by far of dealing with prowlers, however, is catching them, and sometimes you won't have the hook available when you catch them. In that situation, a ballista shot is pretty useful because while it doesn't kill them, it staggers them, and you can easily finish them off with a glory kill or with a precision ball shot. I should mention that if you plan on manually mastering the lock and burst mod, then you need to kill prowlers with it. However, I strongly discourage you from doing that for many reasons. 
perhaps the most important of them is that 3 rockets is a lot of ammo wasted on one prowler. Second reason would be that it's actually kind of slow and hard to kill a, a prowler with Lock-On, but another very important reason as well is that the Lock-On Burst Mastery is actually counterproducing most of the time and it's just annoying, so you want to get it as late as possible if you want to get it at all. One last thing that I'll mention is that Destroyer Blade, any amount of charge, will always kill Prowlers. However, I'll talk more about Destroyer Blade and Prowlers when I talk about Carcasses, which will be real soon, because it is very closely related. Moving on to Doom Hunter base, the first enemy introduced in that level is of course the Pinky. In the case of Pinkies, the advice given by the game is actually pretty good again. Blood Punch is indeed a great way to deal with Pinkies, but you won't always have Blood Punch when there's a Pinky in play. In Doom 2016, it was very easy to sidestep Pinkies because they couldn't turn while charging. This made sense in that game for many reasons that are not true in Doom Eternal. One of which could be the existence of Das in Doom Eternal, but there are others. In Doom Eternal, Pinkies can turn while charging to much effect. While it is still possible to sidestep them this way, it is way harder than in Doom 2016. Of course, what I've omitted here is that you really want to shoot Pinkies from the back because they have a lot of damage reduction from the front. You can, however, obtain a very similar result by jumping over them while charging instead of moving to the side. This is however still not ideal, because it is kinda slow, and more importantly, it requires you paying a lot of attention to the pinky and making sure you're in the right position before it begins its charge, while other demons might be moving around you and killing you. So what we would want instead are methods by which we can actively, without having the pinky start the action, temporarily make it stand in its place so that we can go behind it and hit it from the back. And the simplest of these methods is the freeze bomb, there's nothing more to say about it. The other, much more elaborate one, is falters. We're gonna have to talk slowly about falters. The freeze bomb is absolutely awesome, it's useful for so many things, too many in fact. It has a cooldown so you're not gonna be able to always use it for everything you would like to and you have to find alternatives for certain occasions. And falters are a great substitute for freeze in many particular circumstances. There are actually two types of falters, damage based falters and forced falters. Let's talk first about damage based falters. Damage falters are less reliable, they have a shorter duration, enemies build a resistance towards it after you hit them several times, and they depend on the weapon. So for example the super shotgun almost always falters, whereas the micro missiles absolutely never falters. Forced falters, as their name suggests, always falter demons, no matter how many times they've been faltered before. And more importantly, they last longer. There are at least two sources of force falters, the first of which is Heat Blast. The other one is a frag grenade if you have upgraded it with a specific falter upgrade. I said at least two types because I'm not certain if Blood Punch is actually also a force falter, but I've never heard of anyone who uses Blood Punch just for the falter, it's mostly used for the damage. So now that we understand how falters work, here's a good way to deal with pinkies. Hit them with Hit Blast from the front, and then with the Super Shotgun from the back. You would think that that's us done with Pinkies, but the truth is that there's a challenge in Super Gardeners to glory kill Pinkies in different ways, so I'm gonna teach you as well how to stagger Pinkies reliably. Now there's far more diversity in opinions about this, but here is my two favorite ways. The first one is to hit them with a double charge Hit Blast from the front, and then a Precision Bolt from the back. It's really easy, reliable, and not any. The other way is to freeze them, then hit them with one precision bolt and three heavy cannon shots from the back and one precision bolt from the front. Now in this clip I'm only hitting it twice with the heavy cannon after the precision bolt from the back, but that is because I have the freeze bomb upgrade that increases the damage, which you would normally not have in Super Gore Nest.
And that's us finally done with Pinkies. So let's move to the second enemy introduced uh, newly in Doom Hunter base, which is Carcasses. And these are interesting. Boy, is there a lot to talk about Carcasses, but I'll start with the dots. I don't know about you, but the first time I played Doom Eternal, I thought I was smart. And I said, oh, so here's an enemy that's small, mobile, uh, doesn't have many hit points, and plays as a shield. Oh, what they're telling me is that they want me to go my lead. Oh boy, was I wrong. Despite everything it may seem, carcasses, you don't want to get close to them unless you're killing them very quickly. The main issue with carcasses up close is not really their damage so much as the fact that they knock past when they melee you. They are great at starting a mechanic that I love that I call pinballing. Here, have a look. It's always fun to play pinball, especially when you're the ball, and it means the end of your Ultra Nightmare run. Moving on though, here's a very little known fact about carcasses. They have a gas tank in their packs, which has a specific spot that when you shoot at it, immediately kills them. The truth is though, that because of how small it is and the fact that it is in their packs, this is of very little use. I have still not found that practical use of it, but it is cool. So how do you kill carcasses? Well, actually, Going close with the super shotgun is not that bad of an idea, but you need to have a plan about it. First of all, the hook is really useful because it makes them stand still so that you can aim them properly and get the most out of the shot. Second, you need a hit and run approach. After you've hit them and released them from the hook, you need to get yourself away from them so that they cannot attack you back. Oh, I forgot to mention. Do not bother trying to shoot the carcass shield with plasma, it's slow, dangerous and not really effective. So let's talk about long range options. A ballista shot and a precision bolt shot is a very respectable option. Similarly, a rocket followed by a precision bolt is also a great option, though the rocket has a slow travel time so it's a bit annoying, but it's fine. Arbalest is one of my favorites because it kills them in one shot even if it only hits them with the AoE and it actually pierces them, hitting other things behind them or even multiple carcasses in one shot. But let's stop beating on the bush and let's talk about the big one. Let's talk about Destroyer Blade. First, let's get this out of the way, the Destroyer Blade pierces shields, both Possessed Soldier shields and Carcass shields, and that is invaluable when trying to take enemies from a distance with carcasses involved. But it gets more interesting than that with carcasses, especially once you have a Master Destroyer Blade. Let me explain myself. Carcasses, as well as Brawlers, are heavy demons, but there are subtype of heavy demons that I like to call Fat Fodder. The main differences between heavy demons and fodder is that they take 3 field pips instead of 1 to chainsaw and that they're usually not on a respawn timer on arenas instead of having only one or a certain amount of them before they no longer respawn. Carcasses and brawlers do take 3 pips of field and they're heavy in that regard but they are often in fact on a respawn on certain arenas so they behave like fodder in that regard. But the most important way in which they behave like fodder is what it has to do with destroyer blade. Destroyer Blade instantly kills fodder, regardless of any damage reductions or anything. It, if you actually check the logs on the console for the game uh, by enabling them, you'll see that Destroyer Blade deals basically an infinite amount of damage to fodder. Well, this applies to carcasses and brawlers as well. And what this means, especially when you have the mastery, is that you can shoot carcasses, which are far more useful to be used for this particular mechanic than brawlers, with just one third of a charge of a destroyer blade and it will instantly kill them even though it shouldn't be enough damage to kill them through normal means.
But while we're at it, let's talk everything the Strayer Blade, since it's well worth it to discuss its property. First of all, the Strayer Blade deals a lot of damage, and by a lot I mean it's nearly as much damage as the health of an Aragnotron or a Dreadnought. So that's a lot, especially for an AoE hit. But moreover, there are no demons, except maybe the Icon of Sin, that have resistances to the Strayer Blade, so it deals full damage to every single normal demon type. Now the supposed disadvantage of the Strayer Blade is that it slows you down while charging it, making you very vulnerable. And while this is definitely a disadvantage, it can be sort of overcome or compensated for by the fact that if you time the charging of the Strayer Blade properly when jumping, and furthermore, if you try to do bunny hops when jumping, which I'm not going to discuss in detail here, you can keep full speed while charging the Strayer Blade as long as you are jumping. Speedrunners use this a lot to great success. But we're not even done yet. The Strayer Blade pierces demons, we have already said that, but I want to be clear about it. It, does, it pierces any demon type, any amount of them. No limit. But on top of that, it can also pierce terrain in a certain way. The, the way this works in practice is that the Destroyer Blade basically has two collision boxes. A center one, the body of the Destroyer Blade that determines what terrain it hits on or not, and a larger one that decides which demons it damages. So you can exploit this knowledge by aiming properly to have the, the blade pierce terrain and hit demons behind it with the outer part of the blade. But I think that's about enough talk of how much I like the Destroyer Blade. I think we can move on to the next enemy type, the first boss, the Doom Hunter. But technically, there are three different demon types that have the same name and look the same, both Doom Hunters. That is because the bosses on the Hunter base are different from the normal Doom Hunters that appear later on in the game. And furthermore, the first Doom Hunter that you defeat in the first phase of the boss is different from the ones in the second phase. I'll explain how exactly. There are basically two differences, really. The first one is that the boss Doom Hunters cannot be frozen, whereas the regular Doom Hunters can be frozen. The second difference is that the boss Doom Hunters, depending on which one, have more HP than the normal Doom Hunter. So the second phase ones have double the HP of a normal Doom Hunter each of them, whereas the first phase Doom Hunter has triple the HP of a normal Doom Hunter. So how do you kill a Doom Hunter? Well, as you probably know, the Doom Hunter has basically two phases, when they're on top of their sled and when the sled has been broken. We'll talk about this separately. During the sled phase, like the game tells you, a blood punch on the sled will actually deal extra damage to them. In particular, it will deal four times as much damage as a normal blood punch would, which is actually most of the Doom Hunter's HP, so it's really good. The problem on higher difficulties is that running up to a Doom Hunter like that is basically a death wish. So, you have to make use of our old friends the Vultures to deal with it. As such, some good combos to deal with the Doom Hunter sled is to throw a frag to their feet and then blood punch them when they're faltered, or hit them with a hit blast and then blood punch them when they're faltered, or try to hit with them with a super shotgun shot and then tilt them when they're faltered. Although, this last one is a bit riskier because it will not always falter them or not for as long. Of course, an ice bomb will also work, and in fact, if you have the increased damage upgrade, it will be enough to make the blood punch by itself. Uh, finish the sled phase of the Doom Hunter. However, as I've mentioned several times, the ice bombs are kind of a very sparse resource and there are better uses for them than this, but it's a good option. And I wouldn't be happy if I didn't mention that, unlike other super heavies, the BFE is pretty effective against Doom Hunters and it's definitely a decent option on the first phase if you're gonna kill other demons on the, at the same time. And you don't need to aim it any specific way, it will fin kill the sled pretty much any way you shoot it. But the BFE is a complicated topic that I'll talk about soon. So how does all of this work for the boss versions of the Doom Hunters? Well, it still pretty much works and the Blood Punch is a good option, but since they have more HP and cannot be frozen, it's a bit trickier. You do want to go for a Blood Punch and you do want to falter them before that, but that will not kill them or leave them close to dying, and spending time recharging falters and Blood Punch is kind of considered not worth it and instead it's just better to finish them off some different way. 
In particular, there are two main ways to finish off the sled of the Doom Hunter bosses. The first one is a precision bolt and super shotgun quick swap, or a precision bolt and rocket launcher shotgun. But remember to aim for the sled, not the shield, if you do this. The second one is to hit the shield with the plasma gun and hit blast until the shield pops off and then just lock onto them. They're both quite fast, but the second one is worth more the more HP the Doom Hunter has, so it's generally reserved for the last one. Okay, and once they're off the sled, then what? Well, there's basically one big answer to that with some secondary small answer. The big answer is lock on. This applies both to normal Doom Hunters and to boss Doom Hunters. Just lock onto them. It's high DPS, it deals with the fact that they move a lot and they have a small hitbox. It's good. It is worth noting that it is quite standard to freeze normal Doom Hunters as soon as you break their sled in order to interrupt their sled break animation, which helps both with the safety and speed of dealing with them after the sled breaks. The other small option after the sled breaks is a BFG. It just kills them and it's good if there are other demons to kill. The next level is Super Gornest, and there's actually only one new enemy introduced in this level, the Spectre, and it's a fairly simple one to be honest. First of all, unlike Pinkies, Spectres have no front armor, so you can shoot them from the front normally. Also, due to their invisibility, you cannot lock onto them or hook them, but since they're kinda big and their movement is really predictable, you can just shoot them with a short quick craft rotation. It is worth noting, however, that Spectres can be glory killed, and in fact, they count for the pinky glory kill challenge in Super Gorgeous. So, three really quick ways to target them is a ballista shot followed by a rocket launcher shot, or two ballista shots, or two rocket launcher shots. It is also worth remembering that a destroyer blade will also kill them. So let's move on to our complex. Oh my, what a level. This level introduces the last two types of heavy demons, the cyber monkey and the pain elementals, which I like to call the fat heavies, and also three new types of super heavies, so let's get on to it. The reason that I like to call Cyber Monkey by and Pain Elementals the fat heavies is that they are heavies in the way that they behave with respect to the chainsaw and the BFP, but they actually have health pools and threat levels similar to super heavies. And I really just described two of the simplest methods to deal with them. Pain Elementals and Cyber Monkey Bite are great targets for Chainsaw. Similarly, fights where there are several fat heavies and other heavies are great targets for BFD shot.
Also, in a tough situation, don't be afraid to use a crucible on these fat bastards. What's the worst that could happen? Okay, let's now talk about specific ways to kill each of these fat heavies individually. Let's focus first on Cyber Monkey Bite. As you probably know, Cyber Monkey Bite take extra damage from Blood Punch. So that's, that means that we're gonna split the ways to kill them into non-Blood Punch ways and Blood Punch ways. Well, when talking about non-Blood Punch ways, there's just one that I'd recommend, which is two Lock and Bursts and a Super Shotgun Shot. It's relatively fast, but it takes a lot of ammo. There's a lot to explain to understand how to reliably black punch Cyber Monkey Bite. The main thing that you want to remember is that they do an AoE attack around them as soon as you get close that deals insane amounts of damage, so you really can't just run up to them and hit them. But most people already know that. So what we need to find is ways to get close to them without them doing the, the attack. Yes, you, you thought of it, we're thinking about falters. However, the problem is that Blood Punch is buggy. It's very, very buggy. It's actually more buggy on more recent versions. On earlier versions, while it still fails sometimes, it doesn't always uh, fail. This means that on higher difficulties, where you can't afford to get hit by the AoE attack of the Cyber Monkey Bite, you can't really go with falters that might not give you enough space to fail a Blood Punch, because then if you fail the Blood Punch, you're gonna get hit by the AoE. So instead, you have to rely on factors that are more reliable that ensure that you're not gonna get hit by it. On top of this, it seems like the Blood Punch failing is related to the animation of the Cyber Monkey Boy, which in turn is also related to the type of falter that you did to it. So there are certain falters that work better with Blood Punch and certain falters that just work bad with Blood Punch. And on top of that, as I explained, this depends on the version of the game. In case you didn't know, most speedrunners run in older versions of the game, on which one depends on what category of speedrun they're running, because there's more tech that you can use and less invisible walls around and stuff like that. And it actually changes part of the AI as well, and Blood Punch is one of those. So let's start with a simple one. Although it's not technically a falter, the Ice Bomb serves the same purpose as falters, so it's a really good option against Cyber Monkey Bite. And to be clear, that means one Ice Bomb followed by a Blood Punch followed by a Super Shotgun Shot kills Cyber Monkey Bite in a really safe way. The problem, as usual, is that Ice Bombs are a scarcer source, so this is kind of a waste. Out of the actual falter ones, the Super Shotgun has got to be my favorite one, because while it's a damage falter on an undamaged Cyber Monkey Bush, a single super shotgun shot will always falter them, so it's really good, and you can even combine it with the chain for armor. However, as I explained, sometimes the blood punch will not hit them, especially on more recent patches, and when that happens, the fact that the super shotgun is a damage falter is bad because it means it lasts less, so they will immediately be able to attack you when you're close. Force vouchers, so again, the Heat Blast and the Frag Grenade upgrade, can be better because they last longer, but they can still be pretty dangerous and if the Blood Punch doesn't connect it's gonna be bad. Okay, okay, but what do you do when you want to kill a Cyber Monkey Bus without risking death, you don't want to use a lot of ammo, you don't have a BFG, you don't have Chainsaw and you don't have the Ice Bomb? The answer is Microwave Beam. Microwave Beam not only stuns the enemies for as long as you hold it, but it also resets their animation to a specific state in which Blood Punch will never fail, so it's good at that. However, don't go in directly with Microwave Beam and then punch them, because you won't kill them and then they will hit you regardless, since they recover immediately from the Microwave after you're done with it. Instead, you want to do a decent amount of damage to them from afar, then Microwave them, get close and Blood Punch them. I found that an arbalest shot or a single precision bolt and a rocket are good initiators for this combo. Pain elementals are actually a lot more simple than Cyber Monkey Bye. One of the easiest ways to kill them is to throw two sets of lock and burst rockets to them. However, this is slightly too many rockets, so I don't encourage it that much, but it's easy and it works. Now, 
Main Elementals take extra damage from Ballista and Arbalest, so a slightly faster version of this when you have time to pre-charge is to pre-charge an Arbalest and then follow with the Lock to Burn. And that's basically all I have to say about killing Pain Elementals, but in Taras Navad there's a challenge to glory kill 3 Pain Elementals in different ways. We're gonna talk about this one because it's problematic. Starting from the simple, personally my favorite way to stagger pain elementals is to shoot at them three times with the ballista. You can use dry shopping to make this as quick as possible. Another way to stagger them, technically more ammo efficient and technically slightly faster, is to shoot two arbalist shots at them. However, I don't like this option for several reasons. First of all, it's funny that this actually only works because of bug in the game, which makes it so that when you have upgraded the arbalist mod, it deals less damage to them. If you haven't upgraded Arbalest, two Arbalest swords to a Pain Elemental will kill them. But then there's all sorts of finicky details on top of that. For example, Arbalest, if it hits Pain Elementals in the eye, deals more damage to them. So if you hit them twice in the eye by accident, you will kill them, even with an upgraded Arbalest. And this means one less glory kill, that might mean you can't get the challenge on Ultra Nightmare. This, by the way, does not happen with regular Ballista Swords, and that's why I prefer that method. But don't worry, there's still more issues about Glory Kill and Pain Elementals. It turns out that if you shoot a Pain Elemental uh, when they're shooting a Lost Soul through their mouth, you can hit the Lost Soul and it will absorb part of the damage of the shot, though not all of it. And this will completely fuck over your strategy for staggering them. And to top this all off, there's another more general issue with staggering enemies in general that will often get confused in a run with the last one I mentioned and you won't be able to tell which is which. And this is the following. Depending on the specific animation that an enemy is when you deal the damage hit that should stagger them, they might just not stagger. And when that happens, there's no indication that you went through the threshold and if you continue damaging them, you'll just, you'll just kill them. Now, recently, or a few months ago, we found a way to actually deal with this on the Ultra Nightmare runs. The strategy is as follows. It seems there is an internal cooldown that enemies have for staggering. So if you just keep shooting them after this happens, we call it a no stagger, then you will just kill them. But if you completely stop damaging them and wait for around 10 to 12 seconds, their internal stagger cooldown will reset and then any source of damage that you deal to them will actually stagger them. This actually even works with the flame belts, which is a source of damage that deals exactly zero damage. So it's a good uh, way to finish off uh, an enemy that didn't stagger. So that covers every heavy enemy that appears in the base game. So now let's move on to the super heavies that appear in our complex and specifically let's start with Tarns and Barns. Tarns and Barns are worth considering at the same time because they're very similar in the way you want to deal with them. Even if Tarns have more health and a range of that and Barns are more like uh, a glorified Hell Knight. The main way in which you need to think about Tyrants and Barons in the Eternal is that they are bullet sponges. Yes, they can be dangerous, but you're mostly concerned of doing a lot of damage as quick as you can. And to that regard, the first thing that should pop in your mind is Lock and Burst, because it's the highest DPS after all. The thing is, Id knew this, so they nerfed Lock and Burst specifically on Tyrants and Barons to only deal half damage. So Lock and Burst is generally not a good option for these enemies because it's a waste of rockets, you're gonna run out of ammo and there's better ways to deal more DPS. So to that regard let's start with the obvious, quick swaps. Precision Bolt and Super Shotgun or Precision Bolt and Rocket Launcher are both great for both Barons and Tyrants and they also have a great ammo spread meaning that you will have to change so less often when trying to deal with multiple of these guys. I recommend that you use the Precision Bolt Super Shotgun when you are close and switch to the Precision Bolt Rocket Launcher when you are far. This is the best way to ensure that you get the most out of it. A small technical note here, Tyrants actually are weird in how they behave with the Super Shotgun in the sense that uh, you don't have to be as close to them to deal full damage with the Super Shotgun and it's done by increasing the damage of each pellet but put, uh, putting a cap on the total damage of the shot. So all in all, you can use the Super Shotgun on Tyrants without being so close, that's the takeaway.
there's a couple of small tricks that you can use here to accelerate this process slightly. Uh, the first one is to throw the black punch here and there. Uh, it's not too big and it can be kind of risky, but if you see it, go for it. There's nothing wrong with it. The second one is to use frags clever. Um, there's two reasons, or actually three reasons, why you may want to use frag. The first one, the obvious one, is because they deal some damage, but there's two better reasons. The second one is the uh, forced falter. That can be good at allowing you to stay close to a tyrant or a baron if you time them right so that they remain faltered throughout. And the third one is because when you have it upgraded, if you kill little fodder enemies with a frag, they will release scatter bombs that deal a lot more damage than the frag itself. So a really nice thing that I like to do is to find a, gr a group of imps uh, surrounding a tyrant, throw a frag at them, and see how the tyrant melts from all the scatter bombs. The last thing that I will mention about uh, killing tyrants and barons in this kind of standard way is that it's good to start with a destroyer blade or to freeze them and get multiple of them with a destroyer blade. It can be a lot of damage uh, at one time, but I wouldn't do it as a general way to deal with them, but rather as a starter. Now let's mention a couple of specific things about Tyrants and Barons. The first one is rather obvious and is that they're really good targets for Crucible Chargers. They're just among the best that you can use them on. Now let's talk about Super Heavies and the BFG. Uh, the following actually applies exactly to both Barons, Tyrants and Archviles, and it's also relevant even if not exact about Doom Hunters, Marauders and also about Gladiator and maybe even the Can Maker, depending on how you want to look at it. What you need to understand is the BFG has three types of damage from it. The first one is from the tendrils, and this is most of the damage, especially when it comes to heavies and fodder. This is what kills most of the stuff, and it's why you want to shoot BFGs into the air most of the time. However, the BFG also has a direct hit damage and an AoE damage from the explosion of the ball when it hits something. And these two elements are less damage in general than the tendrils, but on super heavies, the damage from the tendrils is severely limited and it won't kill them in general, whereas the damage from the direct hit and the AoE is increased and deals extra damage to them and can kill them almost directly or with a little bit more damage on top of it. On top of that, the AoE from the ball touching something and exploding is absolutely huge, like an entire screen. It's not just what the explosion actually looks like. So you can hit super heavies in groups by shooting the BFG balls in clever ways and deal a lot more damage that way than if you shoot them in the air, which would only hit them with the tendrils, which has reduced damage for super heavies. The last thing I want to talk about concerns only tyrants and it's about glory killing them. In Necrofall 2 you have two challenges for glory kill in both an archvile and a tyrant, and there's only one archvile and one tyrant in that level, so it's a really big auto nightmare run killer when you accidentally kill them and not get the glory kill or get the wrong glory kill. So what I'm gonna explain to you is two ways in which to more or less reliably stagger tyrants or rather this particular tyrant in Necrobo 2. However keep in mind that this tyrant spawns in a spot which has an irregular surface which means it makes it very likely for it to not stagger. So keep in mind how much damage you've dealt to it, don't deal extra damage and use the 10 seconds hidden no stagger cooldown to reset it when you see that it does a stagger. This is a big one if you're trying to do an ultra nightmare 100% run.
This first method is my personal favorite because it's reliable, it doesn't depend on the AI behaving or misbehaving, it's actually quite safe and I just really like it. And it consists of shooting first one rocket to the turret as it comes up, then freezing it and immediately shooting it with a BFG shot and you must have the freeze in upgrade that increases the damage they receive, then pulling back, waiting for it to thaw, shooting a ballista shot to its chest and then finally when it's about to do the rocket attack a precision bolt and this will stagger it. The main issue with this method and the reason that many speedrunners don't like it is that it uses a lot of resources, it uses the ice bomb and it uses a BFE shot. And actually it's a BFE shot that could be really valuable for right after the tyrant. So there's an alternative method that's more annoying, less reliable, but it's better when it works. The no BFV method is actually easier to remember as well. It's just three sets of lock and burst rockets, followed by three quick swaps between precision bolt and ballista, and finally one heavy cannon shot to give the final shot that will stagger it. And now it's finally time to move on to everyone's favorite enemy type, the Marauder. And we're gonna take a while here. Now I wanna be clear about this, I could not possibly be totally exhaustive on the Marauder without spending like two hours on it. There's plenty of people who have studied all different quirks and aspects of it, and I'm gonna be pretty comprehensive, but I'm not gonna examine every little me uh, method or detail that you could use to build the Marauder. If you're interested in that kind of stuff, uh, I suggest that you check at least uh, a YouTuber called Siler. Uh, he's actually the one that came up with uh, a couple of the methods that I'm going to, men going to mention, especially those uh, more reliable on later patches. So do check his channel because he has a very thorough videos on all of these methods in detail and some even some others that I won't mention. The way that I'm going to go about this is that I'm first going to explain three fundamental mechanics of the Marauder that interact with each other and sort of make up how the enemy reacts to different types of attacks and explain why the different methods that I'm going to explain are good or how they're good and so on. Uh, then I'm going to explain sort of the intended or relatively easy or straightforward ways to kill the Marauder and then I'm going to jump onto some more tricky ones that some people would even call bugs or glitches uh, others would just call being clever and others would just call fun because that's what they are the first fundamental mechanic is what you're seeing right now, the shield the Marauder puts up a shield every time you try to shoot him and he's not in a state where he's ready to receive damage uh, it negates all of the damage or should I say most of the damage, we'll see some exceptions to it uh, and it actually, some people don't know, that it actually absorbs the damage and the Marauder uses it to spawn the dog. So the dog will only spawn if you have shot the shield of the Marauder beforehand. Moreover, enemy projectiles also trigger the shield, even when they come from behind. And this is particularly annoying with Mecha Zombies and Maker Drones. This actually happens even in the middle of a grenade attack, which is what we'll talk about next. So it's really annoying to try to fight a Marauder that has Mecha Zombies or Mecha Drones behind it. Also, these actually charge the shield for the dog as well. So just don't have them behind them. The second mechanic is the green ice attack. If you're watching this, you probably know what this is about, but let's set up the details properly. The Marauder does this relatively regularly, and it's the moment where you're supposed to be able to hit it, and it's signaled by his eyes going green. Um, he does it more often, or basically only does it when you're relatively close, but not standing right next to him. So you can see in the video what's the ideal distance. If you go too far, he will still do it sometimes, but he will mostly just chase after you and throw axes and stuff like that. If you go too close, he will shoot the super shotgun, pull up the shield randomly and do all sorts of random crap. Now you can see in the video 
that even when he does the green is stuck, you're supposed to falter him if you hit him with a heavy enough shot during it, but sometimes it won't work. Now this is related to mainly three fats as far as I know. The main one is the terrain on which the uh, Marauder is. So when he's on slopes or irregular terrain, it's more likely that he won't falter during a green ice attack. But also, uh, the enemies, other enemies attacking that might have projectiles near him also affect this. And finally, the kind of weapon that you're using seems to be a factor in this as well. That's why most people start on Marauder with either the Super Shotgun or the Ballista. The last mechanic that I want to mention, and perhaps the most important one, which relates very closely to Green Eyes attacks as well, is Falters. And there's a lot to say about this. Now, most of it, it's, we've already told, talked about it, and it works in Marauder similarly to how it works in most enemies. There's Damage Falters, and there's Forced Falters. But Marauders also have a special type of Falter, which is the Green Eye Falter. And this is not either a Damage Falter or a Forced Falter, and this is relevant. So, Green Eye Falters, the way they work, is that the, the Marauder will falter twice after a Green Eye attack, and after the third attack, it will immediately recover itself from the falter. So you cannot ever hit a Marauder with more than three attacks in a normal way with the Green Falters. Now, Forced Falters. Forced Falters in general work on Marauders, but they're not as effective. Uh, the reasons are several. Let's talk about frags first. Frags will falter Marauders, however, Marauders AI is coded to always dash away from frags unless they're in a falter state at that point. So you can combine frags with other falters to kind of deal more damage or chain falters, but it's hard to get right. We'll see some combos that use this. Hit Blast also works to extend a falter with a forced falter, however, unlike frags, Heat Blast also counts as a regular shot, so if you do it, for example, the second regular shot in the hit, then the third hit will still remove the Marauder from the Falter. What that means is that if you want to use Heat Blast in a Marauder combo, you basically want to do it the second last shot. It's the shot that you do to extend the Falter to one more shot before it's fully recovered from the Falter because of the third regular shot. Now, do you remember earlier when I said that I didn't know if Blood Punch is a Force Falter? Well, I actually do know now it is, because it works on Marauders to extend the combos. But this video is taking like 9 months to make, and I'm not going back and editing that part. Now, finally, a brief word on Damage Falters on Marauders, but this will make more sense later when I explain one of the combos. Damage Falters on Marauders do work, but in general you never see them, because the only moment where you're actually doing damage to Marauders without a Force Falter is when you're hitting it or doing the Green Eyes attack, and then the Green Eyes Falter takes precedence. But there's some ways around that that we'll talk about soon. Oh, and something else, a lot of this is version dependent, but I would say which combos only work with certain versions and why. So now let's start talking about specific combos. Let's start with the simple, easy ones, kind of the intended ones in a certain sense, although we don't generally like that word in speedrunning. Um, the simplest combo is just to use a uh, Super Shotgun and Ballista quick swap uh, whenever it green eyes. You can start with a Super Shotgun or with a Ballista. In theory, it's better to start with a Super Shotgun, especially on earlier versions, because that can deal more damage per shot, but it doesn't really change much. The problem with this is that it takes at least two green eyes from the Marauder in earlier versions. In later versions, or if you don't hit all the pellets with the Super Shotgun, it can take up to three green eyes. And this is what we call a two cycle or a three cycle. We use the terminology to talk about how many times do you need the Marauder to do the green eye attack to kill them. So this works, and it's fairly easy to execute, and it's not that slow really, and it's fine for a casual playthrough, but it does take two or three cycles. Another simple and intended combo that I wanted to talk about is using the BFG to kill the Marauder. Now this is a lot of resources, but it's, sometimes it's worth it. And a direct BFG shot will kill the Marauder, uh, not with the tendrils though. The thing is, it's a bit tricky, only very slightly, because you cannot shoot the BFG directly when it does the green attack, as that will cause it to shield up against it. Uh, but you can first falter it on the green attack with an SSG or a Ballista shot, and then shoot the BFG at it. 
and this works, it's, and it's very reliable. And it's especially useful in casual playthroughs where you don't care so much for keeping the BFE ammo for other arenas, and when the terrain or the kind of enemies that the Marauder appears are, make it kind of hard to deal with. A uh, perfect example of this, and my personal favorite, is the Mars Core Slayer Gate, which has the worst terrain ever from Marauder, and it also has Maker Drones. So when I can't do any other easier combos, I just like to BFG it. Now those are the two kind of basic intended combos. The first one is a two or three cycle, the second one is a one cycle, uh, but requires a BFE shot, which is kind of a very scarce resource. So let's talk about some other one cycles that do not require a BFE shot, that is, cycles which you can do with just one grenade attack on the other. The first one cycle that I'm going to talk about simply consists on exploiting every force filter that you can think of in the right order and also getting really close for the super shotgun shots to deal the maximum damage. And it's funny because I actually never thought of this combo until I was developing this video, but then I realized, hmm, this can actually work. It's a bit slower than other one cycles, and it requires charging heat blast beforehand, which is kind of annoying, but it's still pretty nice to watch, so let's go into it. So the idea is, you first want to get two shots on the Green Eye Falter, but not the third regular shot, because that would reset the Marauder out of the Falter and make it to move. So you get two shots, and then at the same time, time two frag grenades, so that it will hit the Marauder in quick succession after those first two shots, extending the Falter with four Falters. Then, you want to hit it with a Blood Punch, which deal, will deal some more damage and also extend the Falter a bit longer. Then finally, with a Hit Blast, which will be the third hit in the, in the succession, but it's also a Force Falter, which will give you a short window to get a final Super Shotgun Shot that will hopefully stagger it if you hit the Super Shotgun Shots close enough. If you thought that was complicated, you better brace yourselves, because it's only gonna get more complicated. The next one I actually don't really fully understand myself, and I don't think anyone really does. No, like anyone can really explain why it works. And it's as it uses both Arbalest and Lockenburst, which both have really weird interactions with Marauders. So, the thing is, Arbalest has two hits per shot. The first initial direct hit, and then the explosion shortly after. And Lockenburst has three hits in quick succession. And I think both of these kind of make the way that the Marauder reacts to falters and resets its falters be weird. My theory is that what happens is that the Marauder recovers from the falter in the middle of the combo, but the next hit hits it so quickly that it doesn't have time to shield up or to dash away, which is what it's trying to do. And that's why this combo works. I'm not entirely sure though. What I can explain to you, though, is how to execute it, because that's easier to understand. You first want to hit the Marauder with an Arbalest shot as it green eyes, and you want to throw two frag grenades as soon as possible together with the Arbalest. So basically you want to throw the first frag with the Arbalest shot at the same time, and the second frag grenade as soon as possible. Meanwhile, you want to swap to Lock and Burst and begin locking onto the Marauder, and you want to so throw two Lock and Burst volleys, each of them exactly as the frag grenade falters the Marauder. So one for the first frag grenade and one for the second frag grenade. Now this combo is really quick and it looks really cool when it works. When it works. I really don't like this combo because it's kind of unreliable and finicky and it depends on a lot of things. For one, the version of the game. It, I think it works in every version, but the details of it are different between versions mostly to do with how quick the Marauder recovers and things like that. Second of all, the distance you have from the Marauder, you have to be at the exact right distance or otherwise the Marauder will do weird things that will prevent the uh, combo from working, like shielding up or dashing away too quickly. So yeah, it's cool, but it's just so kind of finicky, I don't like it. As Honorable mentions, and without going into details, I'll just say that there are variations of this combo that utilize micro missiles or blood punch and quick shopping instead of lock and burst, but they're even more complicated and even more unreliable. Another funny thing that you can do uh, to get a one cycle uh, in earlier versions has to do with the fact that when you only hit the Marauder twice on a green eye attack and it recovers, it tries to turn around to shield, but 
the turning around has a time that it takes and if you time your shots properly you can actually use it to extend the green eye falter into two green eye falters in a certain sense and then you can use frag grenades to extend it further. You can only do this once though, I'm not sure why. If you try to keep circling around them or other, it will stop working after the first time. Now the last one cycle that I will talk about is actually the one that I find the coolest. By the way, this one cycle is based on what we call the Feed Ballista tech, which is something that Silar came up with and it's really cool, so do check out his channel, he has all sorts of different variations of this technique, but I'm going to talk about the most uh, relevant ones. So, this has to do with damage falters. As I mentioned earlier, Marauders can be faltered by damage, but this is very hard to see because usually the only way that you deal damage to a Marauder is during a Green Eye attack in which the Green Eye falter takes precedence, but there are exceptions to this. So, the exceptions would be weapons that allow you to deal damage to a Marauder, even if it's not doing a grenade attack. Now, of course, you have frag grenades, but we already discussed that, and it's a force falter, which also takes precedence over the damage falter, so let's forget about those. Other than that, there are several exceptions, but the most notable ones are Sticky Bombs with the area of attack and Ballista AoE. Now, let's be clear about this. If you shoot a Sticky Bomb, or a ballista shot directly at a marauder who's not doing a green eye attack, it will shield from it and it will not deal damage to it. So it's not that you need to shoot it at them, it's that you need to shoot it near them so that the area effect will hit them. Now, sticky bombs actually, I haven't mentioned this before, but it's uh, important to mention this now. If you do hit a marauder directly with a sticky bomb in the head as a headshot, which you can tell because it gets a, a blue flash by the way, then that headshot will deal 900 damage, which is more than a ballista shot and more than most super shotgun shots, depending on the version and on the distance. So sticky bombs directly to the head are actually a good technique. But that's not what we're talking about here, at least for now. What we're talking about is shooting sticky bombs to the feet of the Marauder, so that it won't hit them directly, so that they won't shield up, but the area of effect will hit them, and it will damage them. And you can actually kill the Marauder entirely this way, just shooting sticky bombs to their feet. It will just take quite a while. So, the point here is though, that Sticky Bombs, the area effect of Sticky Bombs, does not have the ability to falter Marauders, it does not have the ability to trigger a damage falter by themselves. However, another instance of uh, an area effect attack that hits Marauders is the AoE on Ballista Shots. Ballista Shots have an area of effect with a very small damage percentage uh, when they hit something. So for example, if you have uh, two zombies together, and you shoot at one of them with a the ballista, then it, the other can get some uh, air effect damage. Just a little bit. It's usually not very relevant and it's something that most people don't know, but it's there. And what happens is that this air effect damage does have the ability to trigger a damage falter, but it only does this when the Marauder has already received enough damage beforehand to be prepared to trigger a damage falter. So this is how the feed ballista works then. You make sure that the Marauder is beyond the threshold of being faltered by damage and we'll talk about how you do that uh, in a second and then after that you shoot a ballista shot to their feet but without hitting them if you hit them they will shield up and they won't take any damage from it but if you hit the ground next to them then the air effect will hit them and if they're prepared for the falter they will take a damage now damage falters last less than green eye falters or force falters so you only have a very small window here to follow up with some actually damaging hits and because of this short window, I'm going to speak now shortly about another technique for Marauders that we use with Fit Ballista and has to do with Sticky Bombs. So I said that Sticky Bombs hits Marauders through the shield, but what I didn't say is that Mar Sticky Bombs can actually headshot Marauders. And you can see this because it gets a blue flash. This happens on all enemies when you headshot them with a Sticky Bomb. And also what happens is that Sticky Bombs on Marauders deal a lot of damage. They deal more damage than a Ballista shot and more than a super shotgun shot in, in uh, more uh, recent versions, although it can be less on earlier versions. The, th the point is, you cannot hit a Marauder with a headshot with a sticky bomb if it's not faltered, but we can do that during a damage falter. And the thing is, it's also very quick to shoot a sticky bomb, especially if you do it after a precision bolt by holding the right mouse button, you can throw the sticky bomb straight away. And even more, because a sticky bomb has a delay to explode, and it hits Marauders to the shield, this allows you to get four hits in a single falter, a green eye falter for example, or 
basically more hits in a regular damage falter by throwing the, the sticky bomb after a precision bolt and then quickly shooting them with another shot like a super shotgun shot or a ballista shot or another precision shot precision bolt shot uh, before the sticky explodes so then they will recover and they will shield up but the sticky bomb is already on their head and it will hit them regardless of them shielding up and this is what you can see in this clip here so this is the feed ballista tank the last thing that I need to mention about this that I haven't yet is how do you get to the damage threshold before doing the ballista feed. Well, in the one cycle version I'm talking about here, you can get that just by hitting it during a previous green eye attack. When the marauder keeps getting faltered by the green eye falters, the, it won't trigger a damage falter, but the damage that you, that you get will kind of accumulate so that the next time it receives damage and it's not in a green eye state, it will get a damage falter. So what you do is you wait for a, for a green eye attack, you do a regular combo on it, and then right after it recovers from that regular combo, you shoot the ballista to their feet, and they will uh, falter shortly with a damage falter, and then you can get precision bolt and sticky bomb on the head. And the fun part is that that precision bolt and the sticky bomb to the head is enough damage to trigger the, de the next damage falter, so you can just cycle this, shoot at their feet again, and keep doing this, and you kind of keep, keep them in a standoff state. Now you may be thinking, this is so complicated, why did he say that it's the best one, the one that he likes the most? Well, it's very flexible. The thing with this combo is that you can, if it fails, you can sort of redo it again. Unlike the Arbalest and Knockenburst combo, which you have basically one chance at because of the cooldown of frags and uh, ammo and just finding the right situation for it. This one is kind of more fluid and if you fail it, like you see actually in this clip, you can just keep going somehow, you can recover from it and that's what I really like about it. So that's it for one cycles and that may make you think oh that's it for marauders then but it's not a one cycle means that you have to get the marauder to do a green attack once but what about if you don't need it to do a green attack at all that's what we call zero cycles and these are mythical my personal favorite zero cycle is what i call the trip which simply consists on uh, shooting the marauder in the middle of a jump over some place where there's no terrain so the marauder will shield up from the sh from the shot and it will not damage it but that will interrupt its jump and it will just fall to its death it's really cool the next zero cycle is actually the one that most speedrunners use for most marauders or actually all marauders in the base game and it's the ice bomb cycle zero cycle the way this works is that in earlier versions before update 2 the Marauder will shield against the Ice Bomb even if it goes above its head and it will turn around with the shield looking at it and then you can shoot two low converse from behind it while doing this. It's really quick, it's not that hard even though it takes a bit to learn and it's just useful. The only thing that happens with this is that you need to reserve an Ice Bomb for it but it's still the best method to deal with them to be honest if you're playing on earlier versions. This will not work at all in later versions because it got specifically patched out of the game. And finally, the last zero cycle is a variation of the one cycle with Fit Ballista, it's except instead of starting with a regular combo, you start by shooting a sticky bomb near the Marauder, which will bring the threshold for the damage falter up enough that the first Fit Ballista will actually uh, falter it. However, even though this is technically a zero cycle, it's a lot slower than the other zero cycles, and I actually prefer the one cycle version of this tech, but feel free to do it. And that finally is in fact the end of Marauders. So let's move on, there's actually not many enemy, enemy types left. The next one is gonna be the Maker Drones, which are introduced early on Mars Core's Layer Gate, uh, but otherwise you would on, only encounter on Urdak in the base game. Uh, Maker Drones are fairly simple, although they are a weird kind of fodder. The main thing with Maker Drones is that they are designed to reward headshots. So they take half damage to almost everything in the body and they have increased health compared to other fodder types but they take a lot of damage from things on the head. Furthermore, when you kill them out from a headshot, they drop a lot of ammo and a lot of health. So generally you want to be getting headshots. And there's two fundamental ways to get easy and quick headshots on Maker Drones. Precision Bolt, of course, and a regular Ballista shot. Another relatively easy and quick way to kill Maker Drones is with a single Super Shotgun shot to the body. 
but you gotta get really up close and personal for that to kill them, and you generally don't want to get close to them because they have a knockback attack, so it's not so good. Of course, unlike all other types of fodder, you cannot chainsaw a maker drone with a single pip, and you need three instead to chainsaw them, so just don't do it, it's not worth it. A way in which maker drones do behave like the rest of the fodder though is when it comes to destroyer blade. And it gets even better, because when you kill maker drones with a fully charged destroyer blade, it has an interaction similar to what we discussed about revenants and the rocket launchers, and it counts as a headshot and they drop ammo and health, so it's great to kill them in groups. Finally, sometimes you need a glory kill to charge blood punch and there's nothing better around than maker drones. So here's two easy methods to stagger them since they're not regular fodder. A precision bolt to the body and a ballista to the body, or a precision bolt to the body and a rocket to the body. It's time to talk about some bosses, let's talk about the gladiator. When talking about the Gladiator though, I sort of have to split it into four parts. First, in two parts, because of the version. Uh, the Gladiator changed quite a bit in update 2, at least when it comes to doing it quick. Uh, so I'm going to talk first about how you would kill it in older versions, which is the ones that we use in speedrunning, and then I'll talk about how that changes in more modern versions, although it's not really that much from a casual playthrough point of view. Second, of course, the Gladiator has two phases, Phase 1 and Phase 2, and they play quite differently. So we're going to talk about Phase 1 and Phase 2 of both the old versions and the new versions separately. But there's a lot in common. The first thing of note for Phase 1 of the Gladiator is that at certain moments he takes a while to turn around and you can go behind his shield and hit him from behind. This is extremely important and it makes the phase a lot quicker and a lot safer. In old versions, the first of these moments is exactly as you enter the arena, as you can see on this clip. Another instance of this is when he naturally recovers from a stagger without you actually glory killing him during the phase. As you can see in these clips, if you actually glory kill him in this stagger period, it recovers a lot quickly and the glory kill itself deals very little damage compared to what you can do during his recovery. What this means, and as contradictory it is to the design of the enemy, is that you generally don't want to glory kill him. Moreover, while the damage is greatly reduced, you can continue damaging him during the stagger. Now let's talk weapons. Precision Bolt and Super Shotgun Quick Swap is quite good, and Precision Bolt and Ballista Quick Swap is quite good as well. But the star of the show by far is Lock and Burst. But what about the BFG? The Gladiator behaves sort of like a Super Heavy when it comes to the BFG. This means that the tendrils do nothing to it, and instead you want to get either a direct hit or hit it with the very large area of effect. And the area of effect is really large and it deals most of the damage. So this means that there's basically two things that you might want to do with the BFE on the Gladiator on Phase 1. Either hit it directly during a green eye attack, or shoot it behind it on the wall and hit it with the AOE. The second one might seem worse, but it's actually really good when it spawns enemies because you'll clear out the arena and at the same time you'll hit him without him having to be staggered for it. The general idea of this is actually the same throughout the entire fight in both versions, so I'm not going to talk anymore about the BFE, I said everything I had to say about it. As a final thing to mention, you can actually hit the gladiator from above if you hook onto some enemy to jump high, but it's kinda hard to do and kinda slow, though it can be good to finish him off when he's about to die.
you can bring all of this together to create what we call a quick kill for Gladiator Phase 1. And it goes as follows. You first go behind him and hit him with two super shotgun shots and one precision ball shot quick swapped and finish off with a BF shot that if done correctly should hit him exactly on the green eyes and stagger him. Then you go to the other side while quick swapping some more and time uh, to be able to shoot three lock and burst uh, volleys on him as well as a frag grenade right as he comes out of the stagger but before he turns around. If you do everything right, this will actually deal with phase 1 entirely. Now the timing on this one can be quite hard to get right, so as an alternative that's far more reliable, even if slightly slower, you can save the VFG shot for the end after lock and burst and after he has recovered from the stagger, and instead stagger him with a regular precision build. Oh, I completely forgot to mention, the game automatically replenishes all of your ammo, including BFG, at the end of phase 1 and at the end of phase 2. This is important. Now let's move to phase 2. In phase 2, the gladiator is far more dangerous and the AI is far less predictable. There are some similarities and some differences. The similarities are mostly the damage from weapons and the way that the BFG works and you want to use it. The differences are that you generally don't want to even stagger the gladiator during the phase 2 and instead just use the periods where he's trying to hit you to actually deal damage to him. So the first thing that you want to be doing throughout the phase whenever he uses the mace shield is to use the shield mod from the chain gun to go close to him without taking so much risk and make him attack you without doing a green eye attack so that you can start dealing damage immediately. The chain gun is actually fairly good against the gladiator in this phase. It deals a decent amount of damage but most importantly it keeps faltering every so often which makes him less dangerous and also kind of lasts longer in this period where he's vulnerable. But Lock on Burst remains the best source of damage for Gladiator during this phase. So as soon as your shield runs out, you want to switch to the Rocket Launcher and just unleash on him. And you can actually do that now because he has prolonged periods of time where he's vulnerable. The only reason we use anything else than Lock on Burst for this fight is that you have a limited number of rockets in your ammo. And just keeping Chainsaw in fodder for this is kind of slower, plus sometimes he just doesn't spawn fast enough. But if we could, we definitely would just use Lock on. Other than that, just keep using the BFG whenever he spawns tough and remember to shoot it at the wall behind him so that the area he hits him. And also remember to change to something for ammo before you kill it with the BFG. There's not much else to this phase really. Oh, keep dodging, that's important. So now let's see how this changes in more recent versions. There's primarily three major changes to the Gladiator that came in update 2. The first one is that when you first enter the Gladiator arena, he will turn around very quickly and you cannot really get behind him and shoot him before he does the green attack. This only happens the first time you go into the arena. If you load a checkpoint during the first phase, you can still do the going behind him. Moreover, if you do hit him during this green eye attack, the stagger will last very short and he will turn around immediately afterwards. The second related change is that anytime you stagger the gladiator, not just the first one, after he recovers from the stagger, he will take less time to turn around and put the shield in front of him again. Though it still lasts a bit and you can get quite a bit of damage in it, it's just less than it used to be. Finally, the last and probably the most important change to Gladiator after update 2 is that Lock and Burst deals a lot less damage to it. Enough that Quick Swapping, Precision Bolt and Super Shotgun or Quick Swapping, Precision Bolt and Ballista is actually better than Lock and Burst. So when you put all of this together and you play on update 2 or later as compared to previous updates, the differences are that you're gonna have to wait for the green attack 
at least two or maybe three times during phase one. You want to use the super shotgun precision bolt in phase one instead of lock on, and you want to use precision bolt and ballista instead of lock on on phase two. I don't recommend using super shotgun on phase two because that means getting very close to him and it's likely that you'll die. Other than that, the rest of the fight stays pretty much the same after update two. Most notably, uh, the VFU usage is pretty much the same, so you want to use it behind him on the wall and ideally when there's enemies to kill besides the gladiator. Moving on, there's actually one last regular enemy type that is not a boss that is introduced really late into the game in Taras Naval, and that's of course the Archvile. There's certain generalities that are rather obvious about Archvile's, but let's just put them explicitly. First of all, Archvile's are almost always the number one priority in any arena that they're present. You want to get them down as quickly as possible. Second, you don't want them to summon stuff. If you're playing good, that this should never really happen, you should be able to interrupt them beforehand. One thing that's worth trying to understand properly about Archhouse is the shield that they summon when they're trying to summon more enemies. And this shield will block either a certain amount of damage or basically one strong hit from hitting them and you want to hit them again after this with something that will fall to them, for example a super shotgun or a ballista shot, which will interrupt the summon. But hitting the shield itself will not interrupt the summoning, so you normally have to hit them twice to interrupt the summoning. Since archvans are normally the number one priority, that means that you're going to be using some really big guns to kill them a lot of the time, and there's really no bigger gun than the crucible. For real though, it's actually not unusual to use a BFG shot to kill an Archvile, although you normally do this when you also want to kill some fodder or heavies that are with it, but a direct shot with a, the BFG will always kill an Archvile, mm, or will it? Damage wise, a, a direct BFG shot is exactly the right amount of damage to kill an Archvile, but the shield can be a bit of a problem with it. If you hit an Archvile from too close when he has the shield up, it can block part of the damage of the BFG and avoid killing it. So a good idea is to shoot them actually from far, but still aiming towards them, so that the tendrils of the BFG will get rid of the shield by stunning it before the main ball hits it and kills it. You can also just shoot them while they spawn before they have a chance to uh, start casting the shield. It's surprising how often we actually kill Archvals with the Crucible or a BFG shot, but not always. And when it comes to regular weapons, Archvals actually do not take reduced damage from Lock-On like Tyrants and Barons did, so this seems like a good option. Except Lock-On bugs out with Archvals and it keeps not locking onto them relatively often, even though not always. This seems to vary between patches and it seems to have to do some, somehow with either the shield or the teleport that the Archvile uses, but the point is, a regular lock-on like that is unreliable against Archvile, so I don't recommend it. What does work really effectively is to freeze the Archvile with an Ice Bomb and then shoot it with two lock-on burst volleys with the Ice Bomb upgrade that increases the damage taken. This will kill an Archvile, it's really quick and it's actually not that much ammo to be honest.
Other than that, the methods that we discussed for barons and tyrants are pretty effective for arch battles as well, including a destroyer blade opener with or without an ice bomb, and the quick swapping the rocket launcher on the precision bolt or the super shotgun on the precision bolt. Oh, but we're not done with Archbows yet. Let's not forget that in Necrobow 2 there's a challenge to glory kill an Archbow in a specific way and there's only one Archbow in that level. So it's really important if you want to do 100% completion to know how to stagger Archbows properly. Staggering an Archbow is a complicated endeavor for many reasons. The first one as any other demon because they sometimes don't stagger and then you have to wait and so on. But Archbows are particularly complicated. First of all, they're really dangerous, so you don't really want to keep them around for very long. Second, they're super heavy with 6000 HP and you need to bring them down to 500 to stagger them, so it's kind of precise. Third, the lock-on issue that I mentioned earlier makes some of the staggering techniques a bit unreliable or dangerous. And fourth, even when you do manage to lock on to an archbell, sometimes you shoot and then they teleport around and the rockets hit walls and then your damage goes messed up and then you no longer know how to stagger it and you panic and you die. I'll give you three different methods to stagger an archbell, but my favorite is the last one by far. The first one is really simple on paper, but quite problematic in practice in my experience, like it can go wrong many ways. But it's really easy to remember, you just throw two lock on burst volleys on a non freeze archbell and then a precision bolt in the end. Next is quick swapping 5 ballista shots with 4 precision bolt shots. I actually like this method because all of the shots are hit scan shots, which means that either you hit the archbell or you don't. And if you don't, you just have to shoot again. Unlike the lock and burst which can hit partly or hit with the AOE or other methods that have similar issues. The problem with it, however, is that it's kinda slow and it takes a lot of ballista ammo, which you normally don't want to use for this. This seems like a good moment to mention a small detail that can be quite relevant when trying to do Archwell Staggers on Necrovolt 2. There is an explosive barrel that appears right next to the spawn, one of the four spawn points in which the Archwell can appear. And it's very common to make that barrel explode by mistake and hit the Archwell with it and then fuck up your stagger setup. Uh, to be precise, uh, an explosive barrel deals around 400 damage, which is more or less about what a precision bolt does and more or less about half of what a ballista shot does. So as you can see in this clip, I hit it with the barrel and then the ballista and precision bolt setup kills it directly instead of staggering it. And what I should have done instead is to replace one of the ballista shots with a precision bolt shot so that to compensate for the damage of the barrel. And now it's time that I describe my very much preferred setup for staggering arch valves. Now this setup is more complicated and it requires more resources and it's actually a bit slower than uh, at least the first one I mentioned. So why do I like it instead of the others? Because it's way more reliable. The thing that this setup has is that basically nothing can go wrong with it. It uses both an ice bomb to prevent the archfall from running around and uh, a heat blast right before the last shot to re reset the animation of the archfall with a falter so that it cannot have a no stagger. Because no staggers are bad in general, but with archbows they're really bad because then you have to wait for 10 seconds without hitting the archbow, and it's still an archbow that can kill you very easily or some stuff. So you really want to avoid that at all costs, and that's what, what this setup does. I've never had this setup fail to me. So to be explicit, the setup consists on freezing the archbow as soon as it appears uh, with the Ice Bomb upgrade that increases the damage of weapons, then hitting it with one lock on burst volley and a ballista shot while it's frozen, and then as soon as thaws, you hit it with a heat blast, faltering it and resting its animation, and then hit it with a precision bolt in the chest during this animation. And I've always had this work, I've never had any problem with it. Though I should mention that if it spawns near the barrel, like I expressed earlier, then the, you should replace the ballista shot with a precision bolt shot because the ice bomb will make the barrel explode. But that's fine. We're almost done now, there's only a couple bosses left. But I want to mention, at least shortly, about Calibas in Necrovol 1 and the Soul Converter in Necrovol 2, which are pretty much the same thing. 
and there's sort of mini bosses that behave in a weird way. We figured out that the best way to kill the eyes of these bosses is to shoot an arbalest shot followed by a rocket. It's really just the quickest way, so I thought I'd tell you. It's time to talk about the can maker. The can maker is actually pretty simple once you learn to deal with her. The main way to deal with her, the best way, the fastest way, the way that everyone uses, is to shoot two lock and burst volleys, which sometimes will be enough to stagger her, and if not, you just have to follow up with a ballista shot, or a precision ball shot, or a super shotgun shot. And you can really just keep doing this the whole time. There are really just two tiny details that I will add to this. The first one is that after each punch or each uh, phase or each health bit of the can maker, she will have a small period where she's invulnerable to stuff, so there's no point in shooting at her. And this invulnerability stops once she dashes away, which she always will do when she recovers. So what most people do is they take this time to turn around, look for a maker drone and get a headshot to replenish ammo, health and so on and so forth. The other thing is that on the first phase, because you spawn kind of far from her and she doesn't have an invulnerability period, it's actually a bit faster to just shoot her with precision bolt and ballista quick shot, but this is only for the first phase and only if you want to be really fast. And that leaves us with just the final boss of the game, the Icon of Sin. There's actually a fair amount of things to say about the Icon of Sin, though I still think it's probably simpler than the Marauder, to be honest. Let's start by describing the general settings of the fight. The Icon of Sin fight is really a long damage race where you want to destroy the same 8 body parts in each of the two phases by dealing as much damage as you can to them as quickly as possible. Let's start with some generalities. First of all, all body parts take the same amount of damage from all weapons in both phases. The differences between the body parts are on the hitboxes of course and on the amount of health that they have. So for example, the head has more health than every other part of the body in both phases, and the head on phase 2 has more health than the head on phase 1. You can check the exact damage values, but that's not too relevant in general. What all of this means is that we can ignore what phase we're in, we can ignore the body parts, and just focus on what deals the most damage. And that's really all that matters with the Icon of Sin. Although there are certain elements about the fight that will affect what deals the most damage. For example, how far is the Icon of Sin, how hard is to hit it with certain weapons. But we'll talk about that. The first weapon that we really want to talk about is the BFG. The BFG is good against the Icon of Sin, it simply is. You want to save ammo before the fight to for, for the fight, even though there's a total of six BFG ammo uh, drops on the arenas, but you still want to have the two extra from the beginning. It just makes the fight better and easier and faster. The thing with the BFG is that, as we explained several times, it has three different types of damage. The direct hit, the AoE, and the tendrils. Well, the tendrils and the AoE deal zero damage to the Icon of Sin but the direct hit deals 10,000 damage to it, which is far more than to any, any other demon. What this means is that you can only hit one body part with the BFG ever, and you need to get a direct hit for it. 
but when you do, it deals a lot of damage. In fact, every body part of the Icon of Sin has less than 10,000 HP, except for the head on phase 2. So what this means is that the way you want to use the BFE in the fight is you want to use it both to clear out and demons that the Icon of Sin has spawned, but also make sure that you're gonna get a direct hit on a body part, and preferably you don't want to waste ammo and time shooting at that body part beforehand. So if you have a plan, you will shoot at some parts with normal weapons and shoot at other parts with the BFG. Oh, by the way, one thing I didn't mention explicitly is that generally speaking you don't want to stop to kill the other demons of the Icon of Sin. Instead rely on the BFG and maybe sometimes kill them something with a crucible when they're being very annoying. But don't stop to kill them. When talking about regular weapons, the Icon of Sin has some very specific weapon damage modifiers, which make some of the weapons and mods that we have barely even mentioned throughout this video suddenly make a comeback in the Icon of Sin. The first of these, and the most important, is Micro Missiles. Micro Missiles is technically the highest DPS you can get on the Icon of Sin besides the BFG, so it's a really good choice for killing body parts. Next is the Auto Shotgun. The Auto Shotgun actually dishes some very decent damage to the Icon of Sin, higher than the Super Shotgun, which is its main competitor for shotgun ammo. And this is due to the fact that Super Shotgun has its damage reduced by half on the Icon of Sin. The problem with the Auto Shotgun is that first it doesn't deal as much damage as Micro Missiles, but more importantly, it requires you to be very close to the body part you're shooting at to get the full or even a large amount of damage, which is hard to do on the Icon of Sin, especially on the second phase. But it's still decent for some parts. I like to use it on the arms and shoulders on phase 1 like you can see here. Other than that, quick swap rotations aren't nearly as effective on the Icon of Sin as they are on other demons, but they can still be decent to finish off body parts or when you simply can't find anything to change so or have no fuel. When talking about quick swaps for the Icon of Sin, the best ones use Ballista due to its high damage and hit scan nature. Uh, so you can quick swap Ballista with the Rocket Launcher, for example, since there's no better use for the Rocket Launcher ammo in the Icon of Sin, or with the Super Shotgun. Both of these have disadvantages though, the rocket launcher does a lot of damage, but it's very slow so it's very hard to aim, and the super shotgun doesn't deal nearly as much damage to the Icon of Sin as it does to other demons, plus it requires you to be quite close to get full damage. But they're both still useful. As a final treat, I'll offer you one unusual but very strong way to deal with some of the body parts of the Icon of Sin. You can actually hit them with the Crucible, but this is really hard because it, it requires you to be literally on top of the hitbox of the body parts, which means you can only do it not most of the time on the arms when he's slamming and you need to know the animation and time it perfectly and also tank the damage that it deals. I think you can do it on some of the other body parts, but it's extremely hard and unreliable. So that's it, that's all, that's the end of the video. I might do videos like this for the Ancient Gods part 1 and part 2, but we'll see, it depends on how many people like it. Um, I'll just add in the end that I was quite exhaustive as the 2 hours of this video can witness for, but I left out some things. Some of them because I didn't think they were that important, that important, some of them because I maybe don't understand them properly, some of them because I simply don't know about them. Maybe there's some things that we yet haven't found out that someone will find out in the future. So, of course, there's going to be things that are not part of this video, and some people who will disagree with some of the things that I said. And that's alright, you make your own mind at the end of the day. Also, if you want to get into even more detail than this, and trust me, you can get into a lot more detail than this, feel free to pop by the speedrunning Discord, which is where I usually hang out, and also other speedrunners who are better at the game than me, spend more time on it, and even some people who are more knowledgeable than me in the game. And you can ask things there, but also we have a huge 
set of resources with things like the specific damage values of the weapons and specific techniques that I haven't explained here that have to do with mod swapping and weapon swapping and things like that and specific enemy behaviors and specific enemy spawns and a lot more things that you can get into if you want to get good at the game or speedrun it. So yeah, I hope you found that useful, you enjoyed it and that it wasn't too bad.